I invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I'm reading from uh, the book of Ephesians, which is a letter in the New Testament. Um, And it's a passage that may be familiar. It is often quoted. It is entitled, The Whole Armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual uh, forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that I may speak a message given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Here ends this reading. Amen. Ephesians is attributed to Paul. In fact, in the very first line, it says, I am Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, Many scholars doubt that it was authored specifically by Paul, but in the Pauline tradition by one of his followers. There are a lot of reasons for that uh, belief, but one of them is most of Paul's early letters are written with a sense of urgency for the coming of the end times. And the coming of the end times is really Paul's message. Remember, Paul says, don't do anything. Don't get married, don't get divorced, don't do anything. Jesus is coming right back. Well, the first theological crisis was Jesus didn't come right back. And so Paul had to re He had to shift his teaching from Jesus is coming right back to um, wait. Uh, The the formal $10 phrase for that that you learn in seminary is it's called the delay of the parousia, the delay of the second coming. And so that delay has lasted mm, 2,000 years. But that theological message of the delay is what prompted the writing of the New Testament. If there hadn't been a delay, and Paul was initially right that Jesus is coming right back, there'd be no reason to write it down. Paul initially expected that he would be alive when Jesus returned. And the first crisis that many churches faced is they had good Jesus-believing people dying and Jesus wasn't back, so what happens to them? So Paul has long explanations about what happens when people die before the second coming and an encouragement to stay in the faith. Paul's letters were actively circulated among the churches um, and Ephesians was written sometime later, some believe even after the death of Paul. And one one of the reasons is Ephesians does not have the sense of urgency of Jesus is coming right back. The book of Ephesians is more of an, uh, an encouragement for the church to continue to sustain itself while you're in this world. Hang in there. In fact, the passage that that comes from is chapter 6, verse 18. 
Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for the saints. The, that's the New Revised Standard Version. The Common English Version translation changes keep alert to hang in there. That's, a, that's pretty good encouragement, isn't it? To both the church and individually hang in there. Now, isn't it interesting that you get to the very end of the book of Ephesians and the closing message from the author is hang in there. So I have a little confession to make. This passage about the armor of God has historically annoyed me. Now that's not really good because I don't know that I get permission to be annoyed by the gospel, right, or the scriptures. But it's annoyed me not really the scripture itself, but it's, what's annoyed me is the way it's been used. Is this armor of God has been used as kind of a vitriolic, we're going to go take the gospel to the unbelievers with swords. And for me, it's in, it, invokes the, uh, it invokes the images of, of the, um, the times when Christians were uh, attacking people in the name of Jesus. The Inquisition comes to mind when the Jewish people were told by the church, believe in the God of love or we'll kill you. What? You know, it reminds me of the attacks on the Holy Land against the Muslims where uh, we're going to take back with the righteous sword and we're going to kill the infidels. I just can't believe Jesus was too pleased with all of that. So when I see the armor of God in typically a good hellfire and brimstone sermon about the armor of God would be to encourage you to take up the armor of God, to take the word into the world and to beat it down on behalf of Jesus. What's fascinating though is I was rereading this this week in preparation for this sermon and wondering what am I going to do with this? Because I don't think we should beat people down. It's amazing that this whole armor of God in the context of the book of Ephesians is not an offensive encouragement, but it's defensive. It's for people who are not ready to take on the world, but maybe just needing help taking on today. If the encouragement is just to take on the whole world, and you just need some encouragement to take on the day, you might miss the purpose of this. But the whole encouragement for the, the church of Ephesus is to stay strong in the faith. It's a book of encouragement again and again and again. And at the very end, the last piece of encouragement it gets is to remember that your faith is your number one defense against the difficulties of the world. And I have to say that's pretty redemptive for me because I'm not annoyed by that. In fact, I'm encouraged by that to take on the armor of God as simple protection from evil. Now, one of the fascinating parts in the New Testament um, is the, is the, the growth of the personification of evil and the devil. So the devil, as a, as a character, as Satan, um, really was a latecomer to the Bible. So in the early scriptures, um, there, was no, there was no early references to Satan per se. And then it wasn't until really the Psalms and Job and the wisdom literature where Satan was seen as a character unto himself. He came into his own, if you will. Um, in the older parts of the Old Testament, all other evil was of human origins. And so the personification of evil, the person of evil, um, really was born sort of in the, in the wisdom literature and then was very strong in the New Testament. So there's this image in the New Testament of fighting against the devil and the evil one. I have to say, I grew up in a home that didn't have a strong image of the devil. 
or of evil or the personification of the devil. But I have to say, as I have lived my life, and as you see a recurrence of evil, you can start to see why that imagery of the devil begins to emerge. Because there is evil out there in the world that people do two things. Some people perpetuate the evil, and my belief is very few people actually are perpetuators of evil who are doing evil. There's a lot of passive people who are willing to observe evil and not do anything about it. I mean, many have said great evil happens in the world when people of goodwill remain silent in the face of it. Um, Hannah Arendt, when she was writing after the Nuremberg trials, the Nuremberg trials, of course, were the, the trials after World War II when war crimes were being persecuted by the Allies. War crimes, what qualifies as a war crime is always defined by the winner, right? Because if the Allies had lost, there would have been a trial for the bombing of Dresden and other things that were done by the Allies or the dropping of the atomic bombs. Those would have been tried as war crimes, but the winner always gets to decide what's a crime. And because the Allies won the Nazi Holocaust, they were put on trial. And Hannah Arendt was a reporter at the time, and she wrote a fascinating book about the human condition and about the nature of evil. And she coined a phrase that has haunted me for many years. She, she coined a phrase called the banality of evil, that evil is banal or uninteresting or, or dispassionate. That as they brought these people forward um, who had participated in the killing of the Jews, um, had a job to do. They were to take their uh, clothing, or they were to work the furnaces, or they were to um, oversee the food lines, or whatever job that they had in the, in the concentration camps. She said, I, I was expecting to meet moral monsters at every turn. And as the trial of Nuremberg went forward, she said there was one ordinary person after another who was afraid to not follow orders and just did it because that's what they were told to do and didn't stand up. And the people who did stand up were put to death, which is a reminder for everyone else out there, don't stand up. And because person after person refused to stand up, this evil was able to take place in Nuremberg and or in all of the Nazi-controlled areas. The banality of evil, that there were a few evil masterminds who had worked their way to the top of the German government who were masterminding all of this evil, but there were a lot of people who were just going along with it. When you think of that kind of evil and you think of people just participating in it, the need for a strong faith to be able to stand up to what is wrong is critically important. And so there's two parts to this scripture that I want to emphasize. One is the need for protection to put the armor on just so we can get through the day. But God wants us to get through the day so that we can serve others and perhaps even stand up to things that are wrong as they happen. But if we're not strong enough to even face the day, we're not going to be strong enough to stand up to evil, which is why I think a lot of folks in the face of evil simply get pushed away and let it happen. I think people are a lot like water. We seek the path of least resistance in the world, and as things come through, we let it go rather than being willing to stand up but our ability to stand up is rooted in the protection that we have in God.
I appreciated Casey uh, referencing um, his friend who's doing hospice care right now. And you think of the hospice care, hospice is the end of life decisions when people are, um, are in palliative care to be um, cared for as they um, prepare for death. Hospice care actually is needed more than ever because our scientific knowledge of health has far outpaced our moral understanding of life and death. And so we have science and the ability to keep people alive a lot longer than some people want to be kept alive, um, long beyond the quality of life. And that hospice care is that important bridge where people um, of faith come and support and nurture a family. And I just want a show of hands. How many of you in your family or with loved ones have interacted with hospice care? Thank you. It's a very powerful, important ministry. That hospice care, when you think of someone completely vulnerable, and you think of this image of Ephesians, of putting on the armor of God as you're facing death itself, what a powerful image that is. It's the counter to the traditional model of striving out to take on the world, isn't it? But putting on the, the helmet and the breastplate and the, the belt to gird yourself and the, the sword of, of, of faith, when you think of all of that powerful imagery of someone so vulnerable and near death that the armor of God is critical, critical for them, and the people around them help surround them with that faith that gets them through that time. That's an image of the armor of God that is so powerful. I also think that of the armor of God when each of us are broken, the image of a being, the church being a hospital for the broken um, and not just a museum um, where you don't touch anything. I think there was a time maybe when this church was not to be touched, but now we're kind of an interactive museum where you can touch everything, right? Um, but also a place for people who are broken. That faith of inviting people in and all of us, all of us have brokenness. And as we face that brokenness, it is our faith that not just covers and hides it, but actually heals it. And putting on that full armor of God, when we wake up and we experience the brokenness, whether it's job-related or family-related or interpersonal or mental health, whatever brokenness each of us has, and we all have it, to know that we can put on that armor of God and be protected just to make it through today, to hang in there for another day. Then I want to take it to the next step. Not just for our own protection, which is important, and I want us to hear that gift that God gives us of that protection, but the ability actually to stand up for others when there's time when evil or other things are happening that we need to stand up and speak out. Um, my dad is fond in, this, in his preaching of this sermon to point out that the armor of God, if you read carefully, there's no piece of armor that covers your back. You have the breastplate, you have the belt, the helmet, the sword. But that doesn't mean the ones closest to you can't get to your back, right? But that faith that we have to stand up, to stand up for what is right, is a critical part of the Christian faith that we need to reclaim and embrace. I want to um, talk just a little bit about um, and offer a prayer for our political system in the United States. Of course, the local government's wonderful, but the, but the, I'm going to talk about our national government because a year from this month will be the primaries for president. Mercy. Amen. Do we not need the armor of God, each and every one of us? The primaries for president will be, which means we have to suffer another year of what we're suffering now. Amen. Now, I want to put this in a little bit of perspective because this democratic process, friends, is it not the wackiest, craziest thing you've ever seen in your life? Is it not just like a cartoon? In fact, the cartoon commentaries are the most helpful for me because if I start to read a whole article about it, it kind of makes me want to weep a little bit. But 
the cartoon commentaries help me. But I want you to think about for a minute, as crazy as our political system is, and it's crazy, very few places in the world have a political process where the people actually get to pick their next leader. Right? Very few places do countries have candidates that aren't perfunctory where it's already been picked and you get 90% of the vote. Where you actually have candidates debating the issues. Where you actually have a two-party system. Each party experiencing their own train wreck in their own way. Amen? Where they're trying to lift up a candidate where they can have a mutual train wreck which will be between next August and next November. But when I get discouraged with what I see on television with our political environment, I like to put on the whole armor of God to protect myself with faith. But also to remember that there are people around the world literally dying for this form of government who would love to choose their leaders and vote on who they get. And you know, most of half of Americans don't vote at all. Half of Americans don't vote at all. We have new immigrants coming to this country from places where they're oppressed. New immigrants who come to this country who would love to vote. But watch most of Americans not vote. Even in the face of times of crisis. And I just want to say, pay attention during this campaign. Because evil is being spoken. Evil is being spoken. And we need Christians who have put on the whole armor of God with their faith so we can get through the day, but also so we can listen with ears, Christian ears, and hear what is being said and call evil, evil when we hear it. And friends, we cannot pretend that evil isn't being spoken even on the campaign trail that is dividing and hurting and excluding. As people of faith, we need to listen for words that unite us, that bring us together, and give us hope. The whole armor of God is an image, not only for the church of Ephesus, to hang in there for another day. It's a message for you and me. To put on that armor. To hang in there for another day. So that we can stand up for what is right in our community and in our world. Because if the people of God, if the people of faith lay down like they did in Germany, like they did in Italy, like they did in other places, like has happened in this country in different times throughout history, if the people of faith lay down when there is evil spoken, our nation has no hope. So my encouragement today is put on the whole armor of God. It will help you get out of bed in the morning. Amen? Because we need you out of bed in the morning because we need people of faith to stand up to what is, for what is right and to stand up against what is wrong and to speak the truth with love. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the church of Ephesus that was broken and hurting. a nation that was occupied by an occupying force. Lord, we thank you for offering your protection to each of us individually and the encouragement to strap on our faith that we might be strong. And Lord, give us the strength individually and together to stand up for what is right, to speak the truth with love. And Lord, as our nation over the next year moves to a decision time about the leader of the free world. We ask that you will give us wisdom and give us a voice to speak what is right and what is wrong. We ask this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen.